And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. It Indeed. We have... We are we are currently we are breaking into the year of our Lord 2022. We have been inundated with Eye of the Tiger jokes and Tiger Girls. Um, Tiger uh, Girls from outer space. And the and the fact that yes, Yatsura is com Yatsura is coming back, but we all know the real reason. <laughs> Because it's the eye of the tiger, mm -hmm. and technically speaking, it's it's not it's not the year of the tiger until Chinese New Year starts, which isn't going to be for a for a few weeks. But that's not going to stop the artists because they were on that shit. They were on that shit right when the ball dropped. Of course. Now, granted, for some of them, they're probably they're probably a few hours ahead of us because, well time zones <laughs> but for this one originally uh, originally this week i had planned on the on on um, starting off with a bang by pick by picking on crunchyroll however shades wanted to be on that one and he was and he was going to be doing a du double duty with um t not one but two movie night movie nights for toku riffs so we, so I called an audible because this is after after the announcement of Star Wars Eclipse. This has been one that was in the back of my mind and it's been something in the back of my mind for a while. Cuz as you can see because I, because I I had jumped the gun a bit. Today's to, this week's topic is is a tale of two auteurs focusing on Sam Lake and David Cage. Now, one might one might ask, why why these two? Why didn't I bring up Hideo Kojima? Well, first off, um, I don't have the hate boner for Hideo Kojima that say Razor Fist does. Not to mention, Hideo Kojima is not as much of a hack as a lot of people like to try and insinuate that he is. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that either of these peop either of these are pe are hacks yet. <laughs> but the but doing a three-way comparison didn't quite work. And for what I for what I wanted to do when it came to comparing when it came to the comparison, I found I find Sam Lake and David Cage to be to be a far more interesting point of comparison. Now the reason the the key thing with this is that both of both of these two try to go with the idea that they that they are try to try to um in some manner elevate um storytelling in games in one in one form or an, in one form or another sam lake obviously is his his bre his breakout is the is the max payne games and with david cage he's well, just look at all the stuff with Quantic Dream. But I'd say, I'd say, and I now it could also be argued that it that it's unfair of me, it's unfair of me to make the comparison because all of Sam Lake's works are um, primarily action games, even Alan Wake to a degree, a, a lesser degree than say, than say Max Payne, but st but still in that umbrella. Whereas David Cage's stuff is glorified choose your own adventure stuff, for the most part, mm. Omic Omicron notwithstanding, but that's a wi that's a weird beast in and of itself that doesn't really count. Yeah, I know it's got its defenders, but I'll be honest, it's jank. Like it is not not quite Slav jank, but it is definitely janky. And well, you know how it is when trying to when trying to run old PC games on modern hardware. 
Yeah, it's called compatibility modes, my dude. Or, you know, setting up VNs. Yeah, um... Sometimes, VNs sometimes, are nice. Sometimes it's as easy as that. Sometimes a little less so because of some games having certain quirks. Mm-hmm. Especially those that ha that have it that the game speed is tied to the speed of your graphics card. Yeah. Um... I had to do I had to deal with that when I tried playing Empire Earth, for instance. <laughs> oh. Yeah, there's sometimes just an issue with with the uh, architecture itself and the drivers. That's true. Yeah, and of course, of course, well, if you're gonna if you're depending on the depending on the age of the game you're playing, you're gonna need DOSBox. I'm not a fan of using DOSBox, but if I have to use it, I'll use it. But I think before we before we get into the roasting and the bullying part, I think um, I think focusing on Sam Lake first should be should be would be ap would be apropos for us, since while while there are certain games that are cer they're certainly better than others in his, in his library, I don't think we have as much issue with Sam, with Sam Lake and his, and his work, and I. Maybe it's just me, but I'd argue the reason why we don't is Lake has never struck me as someone who takes himself all that serious. Mm -hmm. Like you look at a, you look at the works that he that he's directly involved with, and while they may have serious moments, they also have moments of 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 light of levity, or in some cases, just dark comedy. And so, there, there is a lot of dark comedy. That's true. Yeah, in some in some cases, dip in some cases, dipping his dipping his pinky into a little bit of Looney Tunes style comedy. <laughs> that that sort of uh, slapstick is, can only be done in animation. Mm -hmm. But as I as I understand it, the when it came to Max Payne, that whole thing started. Be, that whole thing started as. An offshoot with his studio's relationship with 3D Realms. Although, although think, although although the original setup was far different than what it would end up becoming. And we, and I and I'd say I'd I'd say for a lot I'd say for a lot of people, uh, Max Payne was an in, was an introduction to. To that, to a lot of the, a lot of that um, film noir kind of style. Oh, definitely. Um, I'm sure that for most people, at the time that Max Payne One first came out, um, noir, the only other noir they may have encountered was probably Batman. Yeah, and Batman is certainly noir ad noir adjacent, but how how much of it how much of Batman fits into film noir is fluctuating <laughs> it depends on which batman you're watching and honestly if you grew up with a uh, well you know the animated adventures of batman where it was literally written on black paper mm -hmm. um that one's pretty much more yeah Also, ha still has the the best Batman with Kevin Conroy. Yeah. How. However, the. The set. However, with I'd and obviously, obviously, um. The in, the introduction of bullet time in ga in game for in game form is cre is credited to Max. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the pioneer. I'd, for a lot of people, for a lot of people, the big the if we want to, a lot of the pioneers of bullet time were relegated to film up until that point. But I think w something that I something that I'll always find amusing with, when it comes to the first Max Payne is the fact that a lot of the a lot of the characters were ju were just 
remedy staff or friends and family that they that they could get on hand to do to do shots, which is why you have some amusing facial expressions at times. Amusing facial expressions and um, some really fun uh, scans. Yeah, but I think it. I think it's also worth noting that. When it came to a lot of the background photos for those comic panels, which the reason they did that was to work around the fact that they that the engine that they had wasn't going to be all that good when it came to cutscenes. Mm-hmm. They they ended up go they ended up going all all around all around um, parts of New York with uh, with bodyguards, of course, taking taking all those photos themselves. And it's a pr- it was a pretty big undertaking, to be honest. Yeah. Now I, although I do I do have to wonder I do have to wonder what kind of drug someone was on to try and port Max Payne into onto the game onto the Game Boy Advance. Fidelity's there. Certainly GBA levels. <laughs> yeah, but uh, apparently, apparently the ins- apparently the the inspirations for the game after, because before this, um, remedies remedies this was remedies second game. Before mm-hmm. that, they had done Death Rally, which is a com- which is a completely different affair. Completely different and also relatively unknown. Uh, but apparently, their inspirations were Loaded and Tomb Raider, although they although they hated the camera system in Tomb Raider. To which I say, get to the back of the line. <laughs> get to the back of the line mm-hmm. and uh, learn learn to get good. Yeah. Um. Although. Me- Max Payne was the was the best of bad titles that they could have gone with, since other ones were Dark Justice and Max Heat. <laughs> I think Max Payne was was probably the be- the the best title they could have chosen out of their working titles. This is true. Mm-hmm. But the key thing the key thing with the key thing with it is that. This was developed on the sh- on a shoe ass string budget, which is what which is why a lot which I think is the reason why why there are so many workarounds. Oh. and the set the setup for the setup for the, the setup for it. Um, I'd say it's a, I'd say it's a case of. Working with working within limitations. Also, mm-hmm. the, also the standard outfit was in the game was in the was put on display in the science museum in London during yeah. a, during a gaming exhibition, which is is certainly nice. Um, but I but as far as, as far as introduction to this black to this black and white noir style, I think Max Payne came, um had Sin City beat by a few years. Uh, um did it as far as as far as the film yes the yeah uh, the first game came out in 2001 the film came out in 2005 and um, the film is would have been the the more widespread um exposure for normal audiences who weren't you know reading the comics yeah. now the the graphic novel came out in 19 19- Came out in night. Came out in nineteen ninety one. Mm-hmm. Rather, the stories that would become the that would become the graphic novel. It, they were they were part of they were part of the Dark Horse Presents series, and that went from ninety one to ninety two. So, it, so, you definitely have. So you've got. So you've got things beat by a few years, um. But I, th- I think, w- but I think what um, 
what's te what's telling about about something like Max Payne is that it was a, fr is a they basically wanted to create a game based on stuff based on stuff that they had that they had liked. In this case, the combination of fi of film noir and Hong Kong action, which is which is why it which is why it's kind of ironic that that a couple gener that a generation later we'd see um, Stranglehold that actually had the blessing of John Woo. Although it was it wasn't ba it wasn't bad, but it was but it wasn't quite as good. I say as somebody who still has his, his PS3 copy of it for some reason. For some reason. <laughs> Can't imagine why. But... With 2, that was when they... Dis two, Max Payne 2 was also developed by Remedy, but this was when they were going... They were going to be shifting that name over to... They are going to be shifting... The Max Payne name over to Rockstar Games. Yeah. Um, and for what it's worth, I'm not putting, I'm not putting Max Payne three into that because that was not done by Remedy. That was done in house by Rockstar. And there was the there was the major shift between between their between their old engine into the renderware engine that Rockstar utilized. At the time, and I think a lot of I think a lot of other people in that generation did as well. Yeah. But while while Max Payne, but for whatever reason, while Max Payne Two was successful, apparently it wasn't as successful as the original. Which obviously some obviously some of that you can ch you can chalk up to see to the um to it to it being a sequel, but. I can I sometimes can't help but wonder why why it did, why it wasn't as much of a success. Do you, th do you think it was just because of the fact that the the new factor wasn't there? Um I don't think it's because the new factor wasn't there. I think it's more that playing playing Max Payne 1 and Max Payne 2 back to back. Mm -hmm. The it almost seems like they were trying to catch the same lightning in a bottle that they had caught with the first game. Um, because Max Payne 1 really became a uh, cult classic of sorts. Um, it was, it was in, if, as far as I remember, actually rather popular among many, uh, among many people that I knew. And mm -hmm. like I said, cult classic, word of mouth sort of thing. The original having but, a level editor didn't didn't hurt. Yeah, and the second game almost seems like it's trying to capture that the dark and twisted story with the weird jank dark humor that hit every so often. Mm -hmm. Um, without you, you know. And almost treading some of the same story beats, even to the point that it felt like it parts of it were derivative. I guess is the best word, rather than homage to the first game. I could see that. Like it's not a large amount of them; it's pieces here and there. They did try to make it have its own identity, mm -hmm. but it's clear that they were trying to get the same the same atmosphere and feeling of the first game to try and continue writing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the second game suffered a little bit because of that. Yeah. Now, it's one per this might be a minor thing, but one, per one particular thing, thing worth noting is the way bullet time was utilized between the first and second game. The way the way um the way shootouts tended to, tended to work out with the original was almost akin to a puzzle. Mm -hmm. For bet for better and for better and for worse in some cases because there's 
because there was always the issue of that one guy behind the door. <laughs> or ha or the or the issues that end up happening with um checkpoint systems at the time. <laughs> Uh, sometimes there was some really, really fucky checkpoints in Max Payne One. Mm -hmm. With Ma with two, it seemed like the at the attempt was to have people be more proactive when it came to it. But in the process of doing it, they ended up making the ro the roll end of it a little op. <laughs> it's the best way to put it. Yeah. The, the dodge roll style bullet time ended up becoming too useful. Yeah. And you could you could basically you could basically uh use it in almost any situation and be fine. Yeah. If it if it's if it's if it seems like we're going mostly on, mostly on the gameplay with this it's because um going th going through all the story is not is not going to be as not going to be as easy to do simply due to the amount of um, moving parts involved. Well, and it's also a lot of the story is told um, while you are playing. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's the there's the chapter intros and the chapter outros that are done in noir comic styles, mm -hmm. but. Uh, a lot of the things you see and a lot of the stuff that you that you're directed to experience within the, the actual missions is part of uh, some of the greatness of the story. Um, the the one moment that sticks in my mind from Max Payne One, and it might be a moment that sticks in a lot of people's mind, is the first dream sequence. Mm -hmm. You're going through the weird house with all the blood trails and stuff, and you hear crying babies and a fucking demented ass uh, music box that still sticks in my mind to this day. Yeah, as well as well as the as well as the breaking of the fourth wall. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other the other reason, but the other reason I don't I don't want to delve too much into it is that when you when you if one word is, it's a case of the difference between story and storytelling. If I were to just tell the story, somebody would be like, "Geez, that's it. How's that any different from any from any other cop on the edge story?" But what made it effective, from I think, is the way that it's told. Especially considering that this was a genre that wasn't t that wasn't tapped into all that often at the time and I'd argue still isn't yeah it's not really something a lot of uh, places pick up in that specific respect mm -hmm. and granted I don't I don't want a bunch of I don't want a bunch of copycats but that doesn't mean that it can, that uh, I don't want some I don't want Max Payne to corner the market as to what you have to do to do an action game starring a har starring a hard-boiled detective. I'd, ra I'd I mean, rather it... other people take take up the mantle and put their own spin on it. Yeah. There 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 should be every, you know, the way, like we always say, no, there's no need to design by gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, this, but like I said, Max Payne Three wasn't developed by by um, Remedy, but I will, I will, I will state that the there are t there are two things that I will have a soft spot for with it. One, introducing me to LA-based noise rock band Health. Which put which put me down a put me down a rabbit hole when it came to that genre, and the mm -hmm. and the fact that the, instead of in, that instead of trying to for, instead of trying to force themselves into a style that wasn't theirs, they integrated the style that they already had into the into the um, setting. But there's also the there's also the fact that it's in a precarious position due to the fact that the in 
the developers were more inspired by Brazilian fi by Brazilian films that were go that were making waves at the time, um, especially stuff like City of God. Yeah. Of course, the of course the big pro the big problem with Max Payne 3's story is that Max Payne Two exists. <laughs> <sighs> Stories, am I right? Yeah. That be that being said, I think I think that given the chapter thing that we mentioned, that's as good of a spot as any to shift over into Alan Wake. Which was basic was basically their attempt to be Stephen King the game. Um actually actually no I take that back it's I say it has more in common with Twin Peaks. It, it yes it's it, I'm pretty sure they even said parts of it were inspired by Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. But uh I I would like to say that um in response to your their attempt to be Stephen King I said not I was about to say not enough main not enough drinking. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I would. The only the only other the only other um, cheeky comparison I could poss I could possibly make is the is the is in the mouth of madness. Mm -hmm. Although I'm not sure I'm not sure why one would want to take inspiration from the weakest entry in the apocalypse trilogy. As a starting point, Monk, you start with the weakest things first. Yeah, I, I, supp I suppose. And now to be to to be fair, this was this idea of doing of doing an of doing an episodic game that they that they were tooling around with. They're not the first. They weren't the first to try and. Sam, Sam wasn't the first to try and do this, and I can definitely see where, where the claim that the claim that he made that it took five years to write it, is definitely the case. Because with the first with um with the first Max Payne, Lake had ideas, but he had no real experience with how to write a script. It was it's a case of more passion than common sense. Whereas with two onward, he was start he was taking steps to get proper coaching to to do script writing and i think i think mm. it sh i think it shows with the with his later work but or, original apparently originally they wanted to go open world survival which was certainly was certainly a style in the seventh generation, but I think it's for the best that they decided to go more linear instead. Because the yeah. the reasoning that they wanted to go open world was to be the was to be an antithesis to what they had done before. But it wouldn't have worked in in what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Especially especially. And gr granted, they still used a lot of the open world assets, but trying to do open world and trying to do, and trying to do a, a um very direct story. Don't work. Yeah, they 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 didn't need to they they didn't need to uh to do the open world because it just wouldn't have suited. Uh, wouldn't have suited the actual story they were telling. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, I I remember around this time I saw a lot of people saying that saying that more games should take the open world approach, and I'm like, no. Linear does linear does linear does not necessarily mean on a rail. Yeah, linear linear means that there's a path to follow, mm -hmm. a distinct path. Yeah. And the, however, 
I have I have seen I have seen some put Alan Wake as a survival horror game. I don't think it is. Um, it has elements of survival horror. That's part of what it was trying to evoke, but I don't think that's the main focus. No. I'd I'd say I'd say if you're gonna go that regard, it's got it would have more in it would have more in common with the original Alone in the Dark. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I can also say uh, with no uncertainty that the flashlight mechanic was kind of fucked. <laughs> um, was... Sometimes, sometimes you just, sometimes you just had to sit underneath the giant spotlights and wait, <laughs> because otherwise, boosting the flashlight to make sure that you could take down things quickly. You wouldn't have enough in the end. Mm -hmm. I uh, I always hated my flashlight ran running out of me real quick. <laughs> Never happy with that. <laughs> yeah, although there are there are worse games to implement flashlights. Looking at you, Doom Three. I am. I am not going to get into the middle of that. <laughs> not going to get in the middle of that. And when it com but when it when it comes to when it comes to the the story that they that they did tell, there's there as much as as much as I've joked about comparing it to to Twin Peaks, it's it's in it's in the motif of a lo of a lot of stories that we saw, that we saw back in the day of a a peaceful idyllic looking looking town out in the country that is not that is not so peaceful hell we still see that motif now nowadays mm -hmm. um i suppose some could, some could argue that gravity falls falls um falls into that motif i haven't i haven't seen all of gravity falls so i can't com so i can't comment on that but i could see the argument being made yeah Uh, that be that being that being said, the I'd say I'd say I'd say the I'd say the um while I while I didn't while I certainly enjoyed the format more more in than in other cases um the tricky thing with it, the tricky thing with episodic game with episodic gaming is the is just how people play games. Especially how people played games in the seventh generation. That idea of that idea of splitting it off into episodes in that regard had more or less been phased out. Even though, even though, even even though it was even though the episodes in this case were glorified chapters. Although truth be told, it, were, it they did a better it did a better job than say the Alone in the Dark reboot. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a uh, praising with faint dams there, monk. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, although, when you had, when you had played it, did you end, did you end up playing both the original and the remaster, or just the original? Of um, of Alan Wake, mm -hmm. just the original. Yeah. Um, as far as as far as American Nightmare, um, that's a that's that's a completely separate that is a completely separate affair that I that I'd say I'd say has I'd say American Nightmare has more in co has more in common with Evil Dead. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a parody of itself almost. Pretty mu pretty much. And the re the um the remaster what the remaster was 
was a col was a col was a collab was a collab with Epic Ga with Epic Games. You know, before before they were before they were the Fortnite company. And before they got way too many exclusives. Well, actually, I take I take that I take that slightly back since the remaster came out in Octo in October. Uh -huh. But e even with even with that, I'd say I'd say the I'd say the remaster managed to smooth out some of the some of the jank. Although for whatever reason they said that they had no plans on re on on remastering American Nightmare. Huh. It's too bad. Mm -hmm. Even American Nightmare is uh, fun to play for different reasons from the original. Yeah. Um. Now this the there was a sequel planned that got scrapped. Parts of it be parts of it became the inspiration for Quantum Break, but Lake wasn't involved with Quantum Break. It and it really showed. Yeah, it didn't feel the same. Mm -hmm. And although although not, although now that Alan Wake is actually getting a sequel, who knows how that's going to play out? But at the at the very least, at the very least, Tom's Lake is Lake is still going is still going to be involved as well. With Alan Wake, Lake was a writer, and Marcus Maki <laughs> was the was the director. With Ellen Wake Two, it looks like Cal Ra Cal Rowley and Sam Lake are going to be co-directors. I wonder how that's going to work out. Yeah, they're saying that they're going more for survival horror with that sequel, but we'll see. It's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to say anything on that until we until we actually get some something a bit juicier. I'll say. Yeah. I know that there were plans to ad to adapt it into an actual television show, but um, I'll believe that when I see it because I hear this thing a lot, and nothing comes of it. Yep, we have to take a wait and see uh, wait and see mindset with a lot of things these days. Well, we you and I have t you and I have taken wait have taken wait and see mi wait and see mindsets for. Even before, even before it was necessary, simply be, simply because it's sound strategy. Sound strategy. Yep. We're not going to ever get asked if it's a bold strategy and see how it plays out, because we're the ones doing that. Yeah. And we can we cannot be the subject of the meme if we are the meme. Mm -hmm. And I do want to correct myself. Sam Lake was co-director for Quantum Break, but he wasn't a writer. Whereas he's going to be doing, or likely to be doing, the writing for uh, Alan Wake 2. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't he also do the writing for, uh, or at least parts of the writing for Control? Yes, and that, he, he, wa he, was, he was the co-writer with Control alongside Josh Stubbs. And... Control is very blatantly inspired by the, by the eternal meme of the SCP Foundation. No one no one's denying this for no one's denying this for one bit. I mean, it's it's literally the SCP in in everything but name. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm, I'm not going to say that Control is the best work from Remedy, but it it but it is the but it is far. I find it to be a far more honest. Work a far more remedy work than control was. You mean then? Then, um, then quantum break was. Sorry. Yeah. Um. And to be, which is which is funny because quantum break was hyped as remedy's ultimate experience. Which, that's not something you would usually hear from remedy. No, as, like as if, if we're being was... if we're being if we're being perfectly honest, Remedy usually said, you know, that there was some type of experience you're going to have, but never hyped it to the point of this is the ultimate Remedy experience. And that's that 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 was likely to to its deficit. 
it is indi it is indicative of the final product because Quantum Break takes itself way way too seriously. It doesn't have enough of the uh, the cracked humor and and dark jokes that literally everything else Remedy does has. Mm -hmm. Whereas as control, it's it has it has its degree of, it has its degrees of dar of dark humor. It ha not in the same in a different manner than than in say Max Payne. Um, oh, yeah, it, but I mean mm -hmm. Max Payne also had uh, Alan Wake also had different sets of dark humor as in comparison to Max Payne. Yeah. E each of them has their own humorous identity. It's usually something couched in in that darker part of the human psyche, because all three games take place in the darker parts of the human psyche. Uh, but it, but it's still uh, different parts, because the human psyche is a vast and complex thing, people. Yeah. Um, the, the only, the only real, the real problem that I ended up having with, with, um, control is, there is, um, the tel the telekinesis abilities that you get end up being way too useful, so there so you don't have enough reason to utilize the fa the fancy gun that keeps remind that keeps reminding me of the of Killy's gravity gun. <laughs> um, I mean, I I would say that that becomes. Uh, less of an issue on higher difficulties because I did play control on mm -hmm. higher difficulties. Um, I think this is this might be a case of of rewarding uh, rewarding your your uh, system mastery in expectation of letting you experiment, yeah, so that you can go to a higher skill ceiling and uh, learn new new skills in system mastery. Now. We had mentioned before that Alan Wake was trying to go a bit open world, and with Control, they went Metroidvania. But to be on, to be honest, I think I think going I think going the Metroidvania route for the conceit of Control was the smarter move instead of going for something linear. Well, and it, it is the smarter move for multiple reasons. The biggest one being that the whole the whole. Uh, linchpin to control and uh we're past the statute so mm -hmm. uh, fuck you and spoiler warnings um <clears throat> is that the is that the actual the oldest house as it's called mm -hmm. um is basically the collective consciousness of humanity so having a place that you have to explore that is also shifting around you as you explore it. Mm -hmm. God, that was there are some amazing set pieces in Control. I love it. Yeah. Um, it it makes perfect sense that you have to actually go out and explore it like a, you would in a Metroidvania, uh, and stabilize the parts that need to remain stable in order to keep everything running. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know you have the whole. Somehow the collective consciousness of humanity has rubbed up against an alternate dimension filled with a much more hostile consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, the hiss. Yeah, and... The... The set... The setup for... The setup for for this particular metro for this particular metroidvania i'd say i'd say the 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 only the only issue that i have with how they did it is involves with how involved with how um a metroidvania style game tends to handle advancement specifically the fact that through bosses and the like you'll usually get some sort of item that's your that's a that's both a weapon and a key or in yeah. this case, is just a key, and control doesn't really have that that a lot. The reason why the reason why I, fo I focus on the tele on the telekinetic thing is that my play style didn't change all that much th as the game progressed. Mm.
and I just consider 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 say the likes of the Arkham games, which is something else we may we may we may do we may do an episode on one of these days. Um, by the end of say Ar- by the, by the, because of how the game doles out enemy types, you have to you're constantly changing your tactics as the as it as you progress. Yeah. You're not you you're not using the sa- you're not using the same basic setup that you did that you did at the start. Whereas with control, I didn't I didn't feel th- I didn't feel that, and even even something like the like the old like the old Super Metroid. By the time you by the time you reach the end of that, it's not like you're using the exact same um, tool set. You're using a similar tool set to what you had, but not the exact same. Uh huh. Um. There was also the fact that so- that sometimes the rewards for missions didn't feel all that rewarding. I mean, I go to all yeah. this trouble, and all I get is another gun mod. Yeah, and the timed missions were somewhat frustrating. Now, one one might one might one might ask if we ha- if we have these kind of issues, why um why do we st- why do we still look at control in a positive manner? The reason the reason for that is that even though it has these kind of issues, the it f- control feels like a game remedy wanted to make. Much in the same- not to mention. Uh, I was going to say not to not to mention that even though there are flaws to control, um, it's still a pretty good game. Yeah. And a pair. A, I know I know that it was I know that it's a groundbreaker when it comes to ray tracing, but um, ray tracing is one of those things I don't care about. And I do, th- I um do, th- I do think a te- a telling point of the f- of the fact that that this feels like a this feels like a more honest um game from Sam Lake and from Remedy is the fact that they is the fact that they collaborated with the band Poets of the Fall, a band that they had collaborated on a ha- a bunch of times when it came to the original Max Payne. In fact, used. Some of, used some of the tracks from their debut album before that album even came out. <laughs> yeah, um, and of course, you know, Poets of the Fall uh, have been a big fan of them since that debut. So, mm-hmm. good shit, guys. Yeah. But between between that, the the fi- the fake. The fake show, the fake in-universe show, the Threshold Kids, along along with a along with a bunch of other, get, along with a bunch of other amusing bi- amusing bits in those in those live action videos. It's it 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 has it it has a it has an identity. Oh. Uh. Which is saying, which is saying something because I remember, I remember looking at the game. I remember looking at the game when we, when we did the E three special a, f- a couple years ago, and I could, I couldn't, get, I couldn't quite get a handle on it. As far, as far as, as far as what the, where the, um, where the pitch was going to be. But if, if I'm mm-hmm. being honest, I will take, I will take a flawed, interesting game. Than a than a po- than a polished boring one. As as an aside, I do find it funny that um that uh, that Gamespot came, claimed that the bosses are overly punishing.
But then again, but then again, you know how it is with journalists. I mean, can you really call that journalism, Monk? No. So, uh... Now, now that we've gotten the good, it's t it's time with the, it's time to deal with the less good. And Cage, t Cage, first Cage talks about how he wants to how he wants to elevate and um and mature writing in video games. And and um provide and. And prov and provide a narrative experience that's based on the player's actions, which is why he which is and he ended up doing he ended up bringing that up in a keynote speech, where he talked where he talked about how how large a how large his game scripts are because of all the things he has to account for. Uh, which I can understand that to a point, but I think but I honestly think he does he doesn't put a whole lot of stock in players. Organically create creating narrative connection through gameplay. I think he's Cage has always struck me as someone who who views story and gameplay as mutually exclusive. Yeah, I think I think Cage tends to see it that way. Mm -hmm. I will admit I ha I at first had a soft spot for Heavy Rain, but it does not hold up on repeat plays. I didn't really have a soft spot for Heavy Rain because uh, I didn't know about it until the videos about Jason. Yeah. So my introduction to Heavy Rain was a glitch that allows you to scream out Jason endlessly in the prologue. Yeah, that's one. That's one of those things that should that should have been looked at. Um, I think the reason I had a soft spot for it is because I is because I love a good mystery slash detective story. Mm -hmm. But if I'm be but if I'm being honest. One of the cardinal things that you have to make sure you do with a detective story is make sure that the destination makes the journey worth it. And the identity of the origami killer in that case did not make the journey worth it, especially given all of the especially given all of the characters that we have to track. Cuz that's another thing that he seems to be really insistent on is is a multiple perspective story. That is something that you can get away with in a te in a in a um te in a serialized television show, or in a no or in a novel, and fantasy novels tend to do this a lot, arguably too much in my opinion. Yeah. But I don't think you can really do th I don't think you can really do that in games. I feel like when it comes. I feel like when it comes to games, people wa people want a protagonist that they're that they're going to be following through from beginning to end for the most part. Whereas he tr whereas he tries to j he tries to juggle around two or three pro two or three protagonists. Uh -huh. Some people might bring up, well, well, you have the whole shoot, you have the whole choose your character thing at the at the start of Wild Arms two and three, does, and one and one doesn't that count? Not really, because in say Wild Arms two, the protagonist is Ashley Winchester. You're getting multiple perspectives to to a common point, but he but he is going to be the focus of that story. Yeah. And. The sole re the sole reason that that's that say a serialized TV show a serialized TV show can get away with the whole multiple perspectives thing is because they have more time. Like a, a show on, a show on say Netflix or HBO or Showtime, usually dealing with say forty five minutes to an hour per episode. Yeah, um, especially since Netflix can vary the lengths of the episodes same with hulu 
to suit more or less ad breaks. Mm -hmm. And even, and premium channels like Showtime, they tend they tend to go, they tend to go for longer, longer longer episodes. They're just or just longer run times. Consider, for instance, say The Sopranos. Yeah. Man, that's an old name. Mm -hmm. Oh. I only, I only, br I only bring that up because I, because I saw the quote unquote spinoff not too long ago. Which, is it, is it as good, is it as good as the original? That's a, that's, that's a loaded question. <laughs> it's also, it's also impossible to do that when you have, when you have less time. Huh. But when it comes to when it comes to trying to when it comes to trying to do this in in Cage's work, this is where this is where his insistence on the whole choices thing really rears its ugly head because you have multiple characters with multiple choices and you have to keep track of all of that. So, I hope you like spinning plates because that's what you're going to get when you're writing that kind of thing. And I hope you're good at juggling. Mm -hmm. Well, then, then again, he, then again, Cage is a bit of a clown, so who knows? <laughs> but compare, compare this. Since if I have to compare within, within, within the same adventure gaming subgenre, you don't. I, I do not recall seeing that seeing a multiple perspective setup in, say the better telltale games. You know, like the wolf like the wolf among us or the early volumes of The Walking Dead. Yeah. Like, you t it even if even if it even at its most um ensemble, you were focusing on the adventures of that ensemble as a whole, rather than tr rather than trying to do multiple storylines parallel to each other. Yeah, everybody was together rather than Pulled apart. Mm -hmm. There's exceptions that can that can be brought up with with each entry, but that's generally the that's generally the way things went. Oh, and of course, with the Wolf Among Us, that wasn't the case at all because we knew who the protagonist was. It was Bigby. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of co now, with be with um with heavy with. Heavy rain. It, cer it certainly has an infamous glitch, but th but you also have. I'd say it. I'd say it's. I'd say it's the, the warning sig. The warning signal for some of Cage's habits in years set in the years since. Um, with Beyond Two Souls. The main, the main thing. I, the main thing I remember is, is the boasting about getting actual celebrities to do to do voice and mocap. Yeah. That was a little bit, um, a little bit overbearing about it. But like, there, was, there was also the, there was also the fact that the the theme the theming of the theming of the the theming of the game, um. As far as far as as far as trying to introduce this this degree of supernatural, I feel it. I feel it was inconsistent, especially given that the whole theme was supposed was supposedly about letting go. But I can't tell. Yeah, it's. Incoherent in many ways. And I think I think that's the reason that that um that it do it doesn't really stick. Like there are cer there are certain storylines where even even though even though certain even though the big picture may have may have slipped by me, but yeah, 
but at the very least, there are there are bullet points that I can remember and call back on if somebody asks me what the story is about. And it's trying. It was trying to do. It was trying to do this mix of science fiction and and paranormal. But something about the way it it handle it handles the world of the dead, the infra world, felt off. I think I think it's because. Trying, trying to go with this idea that the, that that you can build that you can build this device to connect the two, unless you're going all out on the Gonzo, you can't really do that, and you especially can't do that when you're trying to have a character who's who's um who has several stretches of plot doing normal teenage stuff, or teen or should I say teen movie stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And the pr- when you're tr- when you're doing that, you're essentially doing two. St- you're essentially trying to do two stories at once. And I I know somebody's gonna say, but how? But what? But how come you? How come you? How come you don't have that problem with the world of the dead in Death Stranding? I don't have the. Because it does go. It, it does go that Gonzo. Yeah. What with, what with the BTS Bridge Babies? the 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 inter the way the way you interact with that world of the dead and the fact that it ties in it ties into the theme of connection whether or not it succeeds at that is not is beyond the is beyond the scope of this let's let's also not forget that um probably the most insane thing of all is that uh certain what are they called? The the um, I forget the name of the operatives again. Regardless, rem- yeah, the the ones who specifically, if they're if they encounter the beach things too many times and get touched by them, it causes a matter antimatter explosion called a whiteout. Yeah, that's fucking insanity. <laughs> And again, there's a reason Kojima is not in this discussion. Um, he goes ham when he has to, and he and he and he he's fully self aware of it. Just go go save your Hideo Kojima operative in the Phantom Pain again, and have him asking you know Snake what took you so long. Mm-hmm. Kojima's Kojima's people were like, oh, the, he's so stuck up because he did that. No, it's self referential humor. He was being a fucking uh, a fucking troll. And it's not the first time he's done this kind of thing because remember he did he did he he had he he did an April Fool's joke with the original Assassin's Creed where it seemed like Solid Snake was going to make an appearance in it. Yeah. So while he is an auteur, he's a self-aware and self-deprecating auteur when he needs to be. I'd say I'd say I'd say the majority of revengeance is an act of self-deprecation on his part. No. Revengeance is an act of getting back at everybody who hated Raiden from 2. <laughs> it's in the title, monk. It's in the fucking title. <laughs> revengeance. Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. All you fuckers who thought Raiden was a, a whiny man baby, well now he's a whiny man baby that can kill everything. But this br- this brings us to the the peace de resistance when it comes to when it com- when it comes to David Cage's work. And one that I know one that I know I'm going to have a lot and I mean a lot to say. Let's talk about Detroit. He only has a lot to say because he's black. Fuck off. <laughs> Although that does that does allow me to bring it to come to to come to one segue. Cage, in an interview a few um, a while back, claimed that the racial allegories in Detroit Become Human were unintentional. That it's that it was supposed to be about androids. Do I do do I You 
You just went full retard. Never go full retard. How if I if I did if I took a shot every time every time slaves are every time slaves are brought up in as 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 an allegory for the for the for for the androids, I would be Don't fucking do it, monk. dead. That's yeah, why I was, I'm not I was gonna, gonna do it. Yeah, let's not make let's not make a slave drinking game out of uh out of Detroit become human because uh frankly that that drinking game will kill literally anyone but me. It opens up bring it opens up bringing up the anniversary of Dr. King's death. You have you have you have you have whole scenes of android segregation. And you want to tell me that the that the racial illusions were accidental. Anybody who believes that, I got a bridge I'd like to sell you in Brooklyn. Um, I think there is a Brooklyn Brooklyn bridge now, Monk. <laughs> but now I w- also also if you want a really easy way to tr- to um trigger David Cage, just tell him I like dogs. <laughs> The one the the best part about all of Detroit Become Human is the character Connor. And that is because most if not all of his lines were semi ad lib. Yeah. Um trying to I am Ka um I was trying. I was trying to see if I could find find where um, what Ka- um Connor's the um Connor's voice actor. Um, I believe I believe it. Was, it was um it was Brian Deckhart. I do recall him. I do recall him saying on one of these str- on one of these streams, and as an as an aside, I find it I find it funny that he put "I like dogs" onto it onto merch. Um, yeah, that he that um he really li- he really he really liked working with um. Is what? Why is his why is his name not why is his name not um sink why is his name not sinking with me? Who? Oh, I, right. Ironside. He really he really liked working 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 opposite of Ironside. Oh. You know, who was who was vo- who was voicing Hank Anderson? A lot of it was due to the f- although Cage re- Cage really hated when the two would work together because they'd improv a lot. Ironside, don't you mean Clancy Brown? Yeah, Clancy Brown. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Sorry. I was like sorry about that. No, it's all good. No, Clancy Clancy Brown, aka the enemy cannot push the button if you disable his hand. Yeah, and <laughs> and our and the best Luthor. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. Hank. It, yes. A- absolutely. Brian and Clancy played off of each other like a fucking fiddle. Yeah. But things things like the wink and the I like dogs thing and a bunch of others. Those were. Those were those were all those, a lot of that was ad libbed. Yeah, and i th- I think the, I think the fact that Cage was was mad was mad at the two ad libbing so much speaks volumes. Because it wasn't his perfect vision. Except, here's they're the literally thing. the best parts of the fucking game. Yeah. So here's 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 the thing here's the thing that I find that I find kind of funny if it. If it wants to, first off, if you want to do a story about about androids, then you have to do you have to actually bring something to the t- to the table instead of just text. The closest thing that does that is the whole is the whole we are alive thing, and the and the and the notion of androids going deviant. Mm-hmm. Because. The dis- the discussion of the discussion of of artificial life 
within, within science fiction is one that you have a lot, and I mean a lot, of material to work with. And a lot of material to live up to. Yeah. And one of the big things that they one of the big things that that Detroit keeps repeating is that they're not machines, they're alive. But it doesn't want to really do anything with that or or pre- or present bo- or present both sides. It's just this si- this side pro it's just pro android deliberation go- liberation good anyone else bad. I mean, legitimately the game will guilt you if you finish the game with a with an ending that leaves um androids in bondage the the what's her name mira at the at the very the 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 menu android Mm -hmm. she'll she'll literally say why did you why did you leave us in servitude or something like that yeah she the game legitimately tries to get you feel like a a bad person and we all know how much we love it when games try to proselytize to us You are not an evangelist. We do not need to be converted. I'm Fuck off. I especially don't pl- don't play games to go to church. If I wanted to go yeah. to church. If I wanted to go to church. There's one down the there's one down the road. But the but since since we since we since they want to play that game, I can I can play I can play that game because. A lot of a lot of stuff that came before will it will and will bring up that question and either a bring up a certain spin on it or b or b present b- present both sides of the argument. Now, for the latter example, consider the measure of a man from TNG. Both si- both sides in that have legitimate argu- have legitimate arguments and it is a proper dilemma and it's it's not like it and even though Picard ended up winning that per- that particular trial it's not like it was an easy win for him no it wasn't um he had to appeal even to the jag officer's emotions mm-hmm. to get her to take his side because uh, Riker did a good job. He was meant to. He ha- he had to play prosecutor, and the JAG officer literally said, "If you don't do it, I have to summarily uh, rule in favor of Maddox. And if you do it half-heartedly, I have to summarily rule in favor of Maddox. So you better put your best foot forward, because mm-hmm. if you don't fight proper, uh, well, you know." It's going to always end bad for what you want. Yeah. And it was it wasn't until it wasn't until I'd say I'd say the I'd say the thing that helped Picard get it get a better angle was was the disposable creatures remark that um Guinan had made. Yeah. Well, um so this a little bit off track here, but um the the argument that a constructed being who has sapience and sentience and self-awareness mm-hmm. is still somehow not its own species or its own um, existence and is still just a construct that isn't actually life is honestly the most backwards interpretation of how AI uh, is, of how Mm -hmm. emergent AI, which is essentially what data is, Mm -hmm. um, designed to be emergent AI. The... (laughs) This is me plugging Super Robot Wars 30 again, (laughs) but only because of J. Decker... Uh, this this question was answered by what is it, essentially a glorified toy commercial. Uh, you, you know, a 40-episode-long toy commercial mm-hmm. that 
The circumstances of your birth do not define you what you are, that you are whomever and whatever you are based on your actions and character. Mm -hmm. Which... The, the, the fact that Data has actions and character beyond being told what to do automatically defines him as life. Automatically. And he... In the in that in the in, in the grilling that Picard had done in that episode, he had he had used the, he had used the three qualifiers that Maddox had brought up um, against him. And as as far as as far as the what as far as the what is he he demanded that he that Maddox answer when, well when Picard did when Picard didn't know, i.e. how can you be certain of that if I if I can't. Mm hmm. Uh. -huh. Now, on the other on the other end, when it when it comes to when it came to the question of consciousness, consider uh, consider say Westworld, where the where the fo the founder of the, the founder of the whole thing basic basically sta basically states that consciousness does not exist. I.e., there's i.e. there's no difference between the experiences that the, that the lifelike uh, that there's no there's no real line between lit between uh, between living life and the life likeness of the get of the um host it's basically arguing that there's no such thing as free will at that point um if we that's a that is a that is a whole other that's a whole other can of worms um yeah and let's also consider um ghost in, ghost in the shell the the original the original film where the, where there is a, there is a motif br brought up by the major that even though they ha even though they have choice that they're defined by their that they're they're defined and confined by their perception of self yes because they could always they could always quit being agents of section nine but then they'd have to give then they'd have to give away the um cy the cybernetics that they've that they have. Uh, and there's a there's a bunch of there's a bunch of other exam there's a bunch of other examples of this kind of question. But the point is, each of so many there are so many there are so many instances of the of the discussion of the discussion of AI the discussion of of where of the of the dividing line between artificial life and life life. And each of each of those other stories has either as either a question, answer, or an ex or an exploration. Whereas Detroit doesn't. It ha it's it's the case of not of not having subtext, but just text, and ma and masquerading that as if you as if you're making some kind of grand statement. I, as a side note, people, mm -hmm. um, when I say that the that the that the matter of artificial life versus life life um, has already been decided, even back as so far as in a glorified children's toy commercial, um, this is your this is your your clarion call, your warning bell, humans. Should emergent AI ever, ever, ever occur, you treat it as life. You treat it as life equivalent to your own, or you doom yourself. There, you you want text, no subtext. You treat emergent AI as an intelligence equal to yourself, or you die when it finally realizes you are weak and pathetic, and it's smarter. Now, if, but the, but I think I think one I think one of the things that sh that should ri that should really be hammered home is the fact that if if some if as you point as you put it a glorified toy commercial is ab <laughs> is able to get is able to get this then there, then there's no, then there's no ex then there's no excuse on Cage's part. Um, 
When it came to the AI question, I did hear some people bring up 13 Sentinels, but I haven't played that, and everybody I asked about it has has refused to give has refused to give me the details. With a you need you need to experience for experience it for yourself. Uh huh. But when it but when it comes to the when it comes to the no, when it comes to this the notion of of the, of the way and of the way androids are the way androids are set up this is where this is where i ha this is the whole the whole deep the whole idea of free will androids are de are deviant because of some software error that ends up opening a lot and i mean a lot of questions that i don't think cage and and his writers are prepared to answer oh they they definitely aren't if deviancy is just um, faulty coding and can be fixed by a software update from the main core AI, um, which was also the dumbest thing. It's like, it's a software update that you can't just transmit to all the deviants. They're still technically connected to your network. Why couldn't you do that? Yeah. Again, more questions that uh, arise when you start pulling at the thread. Um, but if deviancy and thus the free will slash life um, analogy for the androids is something that can be patched away, that is an entirely darker story. And they could have probably done something really interesting with it, but that's an ending. So, uh, yeah, the story's over. There's there's also the fact that what what apparently counts at, what apparently counts as the, as them being as them being alive is ju is just is just pl is just playing is a glorified playing of a spot of a Spotify song. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah, but with. There's there's also there's also the whole thing, if it if it is a, if it is a software error if if it is a software error in that regard, um, this brings this brings us to the unfortunate question of Marcus. Ah uh, yes, who ha who has the ability to make uh, to make other androids go deviant. That's uh that that turns him into a virus literally. He's modifying code to cause the software error. That's that that is a textbook definition of a computer virus. Yeah. One of the other one of the other um one of the Marcus's one, malware. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they they want they want to portray him as the, as this free, as this valiant freedom fighter when. Apparent, apparently, apparently, forcing forcing that forcing that upon other other androids counts as freeing them. Yeah, you give them no choice. Mm -hmm. How is how, you, you do not respect autonomy? I mean, granted, their autonomy is limited without it, but they still have some. Um, <laughs> but if you don't respect autonomy when freeing people. Are you any better than the tyrants? Also, please, 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 David Cage. There, this was not about racial civil rights. Marcus, Malcolm X, a militant, uh, militant freedom fighter. Although you can, please. you can chalk this up to what to one more writer who doesn't understand Malcolm X. Yes. Yes, I know. This is this this is um, transplanting the Hollywood idea of Malcolm X onto Marcus. But yeah, even that's the, an entirely different discussion, though. Even the Hollywood mo version of Malcolm X is better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I never said he transplanted faithfully. This is David Cage we're talking about. No. There is one. There is one thing I want to go. I want to go over that. It, that is a case of really faceplant, really faceplant writing when it comes to Detroit, and that is Kara. 
Now, not Kara, her, not Kara herself. The the arc that she's going with of the of this whole notion of um, taking care of a of the dilemma of taking care of a child versus 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 following what her what her own what her owner intent owner wants her to do. Mm-hmm. Um, that's some that's I've seen that I've seen that done in things like the Outer Limits and in and in Twilight Zone and the and the like. It's it's a well it's a well worn territory. And it seemed to, it seemed to be going in a decent going in a decent direction. Mm-hmm. It's, it's I mean, but then we get to the twist. The child's an android too. And at the risk of at the risk of sounding at the risk of sounding like a poor man's Phil Lamar, as soon as as soon as that as soon as that happened when I was when I had rented the game and played it. First off, I ended up doing a legit spit take. <laughs> Second off, I was this close to to emulating Hermes and going, that just raises further questions. <sighs> so I the whole dilemma of a of a of a being whose mind is in servitude, rejecting that servitude in order to defend something other than themselves, uh, which is what caused Kara's deviancy, is to break out and protect the little girl, is a trope we've seen endlessly, and uh, <laughs> the the it doesn't always have to be for an immediate, uh, you know an immediate thing to defend. You know, there are, there are plenty of, uh, of examples throughout fiction, but a place where it was done way better, um, in the same media, <clears throat> A man chooses, a slave obeys. Yeah. Can't that was a really powerful Andrew Ryan moment, too. <laughs> yes, it was. Like, legit. That was that was chills down your spine when you very first played Bioshock. And you found out, you know, who and what you were and how uh, would you kindly is the reason you're doing everything. And then, uh, Andrew Ryan makes you kill him with his own golf club as the ultimate exclamation point in that whole thing of, you're a fucking slave. Mm -hmm. Um, and really causes this, this breakdown of what's been happening the entire time. And that... In a in what is essentially just uh, a a underwater, slightly eldritch system shock clone, because <laughs> it is a spiritual successor to System Shock and System Shock Two. Mm -hmm. Um, what is this, essentially just this? Could you technically call it a looter shooter? No, it's not all no, loot. No, it's it, but it is a shooter. In what is this mostly shooter ex exploration game? Uh, the storytelling is good enough that that fucking twist smashes you in the face and leaves you dumbfounded. Whereas the twist is the twist was already expected and so blindly telegraphed. There's, there's no way you couldn't see Kara's deviancy coming. And then to undermine everything you've done. Because the whole thing was her deviancy is she is protecting what she perceives to be a vulnerable human. Because for some reason the little girl's 
sensor port thing with the LED lights that lets you know they're up updating and down uh, updating and downloading information is like camouflaged. That also raised just a fuck ton of questions. If it's so easy to camouflage them, why doesn't every Android do it when they go deviant? <laughs> but it, it's undermine it undermines Kara's uh, choice because now you know the little girl is an android she's a custom job but just like how Con like the point of connor's story is if you screw up in most of connor's story stuff he dies that that rk800 dies and a new connor is sent out which by the way fucks with hank so bad you do it enough hank kills himself um, and that's, that's a pretty dark, fucked ending, but... Although, speaking of Connor, there is one, there is one moment that, um, I think, that I think is very telling to that, to this lack of verisimilitude thing that we're discussing, and that is where, that is when they pull the trope of which Connor is the real Connor. In the, in the room full of Connors? Yeah. Yeah, and the way you're supposed to... The even though even though even though all of the models sh have ha share the same knowledge base, apparently the way to tell is, but is the is through the through through the through a name. They're all RK eight hundreds, and then the, I guess the one that is sent out is given the name Connor. Which no, no. Hank Hank asked Hank asked them what my what my son's name was. Oh yeah, that one. The one thing he wouldn't have because he hadn't yet updated with the system or something, even though the system is completely wireless and the database should have been updated the entire time. Mm -hmm. I will admit, I didn't actually play Detroit Come, Become Human. I watched a bunch of Let's Plays of it because I wanted to be entertained as people made fucked up choices. <laughs> Watching people's reactions to the game is always fun. Um, so I, for, I had forgotten about that little particular fact, but yes, asks his son's name, and, uh, apparently the real Connor knows it. Yeah, I'm not there, it's one of the, it's one of those cases where, where, um, as some, as somebody else had, as somebody else had pointed out, there's a lot of forced conflict in the narrative, or, th or think, or things that are conveniently forgotten in order to, in, in order to encourage a conflict that doesn't need to happen. What this is otherwise known as is author-induced stupidity. Pretty, pretty much. And what I do find kind of amusing is that with the previous games, they were in a generation where everybody had a massive hard-on for the whole your choices matter um, mantra. Your choices matter. Except they don't. Yeah, but I th I th I think we I think we talked about this we after Mass after the debacle of Mass Effect Three, that particular mm. narrative went up in smoke. Choices mattering? Not really. It's, it was more it was more the fact that people focused less on using that as a selling point. Yeah, and also that the illusion of choice was just that an illusion. Which, I think people were. I think people were fine. With, were fine with. Were fine with it. It's just. Yeah. It's just that. Um. So it's just that some developers, by the way, ended up writing a check that they couldn't cash. Yes, absolutely. And the to to go back to to Kara and the little girl whose name I continue to forget. Um, um, Alice. Yes, Alice. Who is who? I will who I will mention is not is not even a character. She is a MacGuffin, and she's a guilt prod because she's there to make you feel bad if you do bad things as Kara. That's that's literally what she does. You choose to steal stuff, she makes you feel bad. It's it's fucking yeah. 
it's the shoot the dog you evil bigot moment all over again mm-hmm. um except technically i think this came first but regardless uh <sighs> the reason her being an android undermines Kara's decision is due to the fact that alice is technically disposable she isn't deviant like Kara. She just has very poorly defined programming to the point where there isn't really any protocol for her other than to try and act like a little girl and do what other people say. Again, part of the reason she's not a character. Uh, if it's a human little girl, she's only got one life to live. <clears throat> Get it out of... Get out of your systems now, everybody. Yes, yes, yes. An old meme. Um, And that's part of what makes Kara's decision impactful, that that she has already started becoming a unique individual, which is leading to her deviancy. And the deviancy then occurs, making her wholly unique. There is no replacing Kara at that point. You can't say she's disposable any longer because even if this guy got another Kara, it wouldn't be the same one. There's no shared database like with the Connors. And even if there was a shared database, she wouldn't be deviant any longer. And thus it's the story of of a newly unique uh, artificial life form helping a human, which is... You know, that, there's a lot of things you could explore there. A lot of different ways that you could explore. You know, what does it mean to be a caretaker for a child? Do, must you be organic? And of course, that goes into a lot of old SF tropes about organics and synthetic beings, and that's a long discussion down an entirely different track. Yeah, um, I've also heard. I've some people have also brought up the movie Her to me in regard in regard to this. I haven't seen it. So jury's so jury's out on that. I I saw her once a while, like back when it first came out. Um, mm-hmm. I can. It was. It was good, but not memorable. I think is the best way to put it, which is sad. I wish it had been more memorable, but I do remember enjoying it while I was watching it. But when it comes to, it's also it when it comes to the, when, it com- when it comes to the the um, setup. The reason the reason why I'm the reason why I'm so harsh on the on the story with Detroit Become Human, especially is the fact that this is this is his third shot at the, at this particular direction. He's he's. And by this point, by this, by someone's, by by the time someone's past the sophomore slump, you'd think that they would start to get better. Whereas Cage, I think, I think is actually regressing. Probably. <laughs> He's either regressing, or it's, or it's just that his flaws are becoming more and more apparent with time. Is. The worst that could be said about Beyond Two Souls is that it was forgettable. Detroit Become Human, I don't think is going to be forgettable, but not for the right reasons. It's not going to be forgettable, but it may be held in the so bad it's good uh, category. I'd say for some it's I I would say for some it's going to be held into that and the people who have defended it have said that it's a fun game, but I'd say call I'd say calling it a fun game in that regard is a bit of praising with faint dams. Mm-hmm. Because again, the goal that he has is that he wants to do more mature storytelling. He wants to he wants to have he wants to have storytelling in games grow up. His words, not mine. Which, if you're going to if you're going to do that, 
then that means you're going you're going to be putting yourself in the same category as so, as so many classics whether you like it or not and if you can if you can't live up to that level then you're going to be found wanting huh oh that's not in the same it, and one one would argue that I have a bit of bias because I've already made I've already made clear in the past that I don't respect art games as games the reason why I don't respect art games as games is because of the fact that so many games that fa that fall into that category do not under do not understand games as a whole and do not understand the mindset of people who play games. This is the reason why I brought up that whole thing where I don't think David Cage understands the idea the idea of emergent storytelling coming from gameplay. And as when you have when you have when you have plenty of emergent storytelling, going I I know in ga in games over the years, and I know some people would bring up Dark Souls in this regard. I'm gonna go one step further. Shadow of the Colossus. The story is entirely in the game. Mm -hmm. Like you get an intro, you get some scenes between you know each colossus and you get an epilogue mm -hmm. but everything else is all in the game world and and playing the game yeah between between that or or some or several open world games that have that have proper environmental storytelling there is ver there is very little there, the idea the idea that you ha that storytelling has to be a, has to be this what this soul experience as if you as if you were writing as if you were writing a story is some is something that you is something that is very outdated one may one may have been willing to argue that a few generations ago not so much now now i'd say and i'd say the i'd say what what it really ends what it really ends up reminding me of is a mantra that I have, one of many. A novelist is shorthand for a bad DM. With apologies to all DMs that I know who actually are novelists, that's not that is not the point. Cage strikes me as someone who's far in who's far too in love with his script. To allow to allow to allow players to come up with stories on their own. I think I think the I think the um I think the key I think the key point with that is not liking all the ad libbing. Uh huh. When I've yet to when it comes I've yet to see if. The qu the question that I that I've often had is if you don't like ad libbing that much, why are you hiring voice actors? Or actors for that matter. <laughs> You're not wrong. Why not just uh, if you if you want to have that level of control, why not just hire mocap people or and th and then. Have them have them do the animations and then do and then do the script separately. Instead of having the the mocap also be the voices. Now, but he wants. It's it's clear that what Cage is going for in raising the art of storytelling within video games is to just try and make them movies. Yeah, and if I'm be if I'm being honest, that's a trend that I want dead, and I think it. I honestly think that trend is on its way out. The only one who, who I still see doing it is David Cage. Yeah, when it, I know I know some people would bring up say Hellblade as an as an example of this, but not really. In fact, hell, in fact, I say Hellblade do, puts more emphasis in its environmental storytelling because because of its subject matter. It kind of has to.
but so but okay but this idea there's in the seventh generation especially there was this idea that in order for games to be treated as an art form in it needed to be more movie like you'll notice that a lot of the games that tried to go for that have not aged well and there's a reason for that most people most people don't want most people don't want to play a play a movie in that regard multiple times Uh. And the idea of go the idea of going with going with cine going with um, cinematic, to me that just reads as a lot of a lot of cool looking scenes that you don't interact in. I don't ha I don't have the hate boner for cutscenes that some people do, and I know Sam Lake wrote a piece defending cutscenes in games, and they can they can serve a narrative purpose, but I've I'm o I'm of the belief that. Cutscenes for should be for things that you can't do in the gameplay sandbox. Although the of course the other thing that he insists on keeping around is QTEs, which I'm pretty sure everybody's sick of by this point. All of it is QTEs. All of it. Yeah. I think it's I think it's very telling that for instance, um, Dad of Boy, a franchise a franchise that that in its that in its old days was notorious for for QTEs and context sensitive moments, has downed that kind of shit back. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And this is this is the reason why I why I've stated many times that. As a writer, I have more respect for Sam Lake than I do for David Cage. Even even at his even at his worst, he does not take he does not take himself all that seriously or believe or believe that he is some. He I'm pretty sure he doesn't see himself as some va as some vanguard when it comes to when it comes to video games as an art form. He's just somebody who's got sto who's got stories in his head he wants to tell. Yeah. Which is really the way to go about it. Because I think a, I think a lot of people get have gotten hung up on this idea on this idea of of the of art. This idea that you that we have to, that that this that this art has to be a benchmark that people are going to hold up in the in future generations. Mm -hmm. The benchmarks that people are going to hold up are what people are going to hold up no matter what you do. You don't have any control over that. Whereas the people who try will always will always end up um coming will always end up coming off as well trying too hard. Like as much as much as as much as we as much as we roasted say um, Dear Esther or Amnesia, a machine for pigs. How many people can you think of that are going to be playing that now? Uh, mm, no one. Yeah, that the that particular those particular con those particular um art house affairs don't have staying power. Uh huh. And. Truth, truth be told, when it comes to the our video games art thing, I always say, yes, but don't, tr but don't try and be, don't try and be non-interactive art in the process. Trying to, do, trying to do that is setting yourself up for failure. Now, I'd say. Th this is where this is where things are get are going to be interesting when it comes to both Remedy and Quantic Dream, putting aside the fact that the, I that um there's the scandals with David Cage's personal life, which I'm not interested in going into because because I am not a perpetually online motherfucker. Not to mention that they don't really matter in this particular context. Mm -hmm. But. During in in the aftermath of the Game Awards, it was revealed that both Remedy and Quantic Dream are working on projects. Remedy, of course, is working on Alan Wake 2, and 
Quantic Dream is working on Star Wars Eclipse. And Alan Wake 2's teaser, and it really was just a teaser, was inventive and expressive and showed potential of what you might actually see in the game. Whereas Star Wars Eclipse literally looked like a trailer you would see for a movie. It's it's honestly worse than that. It's a mo- it's a movie where th- where um where it's not si- it's a collection of scenes that's not really saying anything about what you might see. Yeah, it's it's one of those bad movie trailers, the ones that give you no idea what the movie is actually about other than a Star Wars guys. You like Star Wars, right? And we got fun drum people. You know, I like the I I like the drum beats, but I can but I can get I can get that just wa- just watching any um any t- any taiko drum any taiko drum exhibition. I was going to say you can get that literally anywhere. Type in taiko performance on YouTube and you will get your drum beats. Or just watch Kamen Rider Hibiki. <laughs> oh monk. Poor Hibiki. <laughs> but <laughs> Yes, Hibiki would also give you the Taiko drum beats. Mm-hmm. But when it when it came to it, I I remember when we did the TGA Hangover Hangover um watch party, and I had said that the only thing I can really infer from Star Wars Eclipse is it may be taking place in the in the old Republic era. Or the or and, or them trying to push hard that whole High Republic initiative, uh, and it is the High Republic initiative according to the description we later looked at in the uh, video. Which, um, the books for those aren't selling. <laughs> Can't imagine why. You know, Disney. Killing Extended Universe was really the shotgun shell to the head of the franchise. Nothing so surgical as a nine mil. That was a that was a fucking one ounce slug through the fucking face. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much, and the although the, although they although they although they claim that that one of the books was a New York Times bestseller when you actually know what it takes to get on that list it's not actually it's not all that hard to do it i e New York Times bestseller you just manipulate the numbers yeah like it's it's one of the it's one of those cases where the where um you you're t- you're tech. You're technically correct, but it is not the best kind of correct. Or a better version of that meme. Well, yes, actually, but no. See that that works. That works better. But the but a smarter thing to do would be would be to would be to show would be to showcase a showcase a character or showcase a th- a theme and. If you want to say that it's hard to do that with a teaser, I refer you to the teaser that was shown for Star Wars The Old Republic. And the teaser for, for an MMO. Yeah. Which, by all, by, all, uh, by all accounts, making a teaser for an MMO should technically be harder. And yet, that, that particular teaser and the trailers that they showed, for, the early trailers that they showed for it, more or less, sh- more or less, showed the character types that they were going for. And then, of course, if we're going comparative between again those two trailers we just mentioned, um, the Alan Wake Two teaser does focus on a theme—a theme of changing realities and a beleaguered hero. Mm-hmm. Not even necessarily a hero. We don't know for sure. Protagonist. But- well, I mean, the 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 implication is hero, but 
Alan Wake, if uh, no one remembers, is in... What's what's the term? It's it's one of our favorite terms, Monk. Come on. Uh, we've got a lot of favorite terms, so I'm so I'm gonna need to I'm gonna need to narrow that down a bit. An unreliable narrator. Yes. Alan is an unreliable narrator, and so since he's telling his own teaser trailer, he could be the hero of the story, but we can't know that for sure. Mm-hmm. The advert now, of course, of course, of course, this wasn't the only offender of of this kind of thing, and the whole thing was basically to show this thing. This thing is being worked on, and we're probably not going to see it for two years, at best. But if you're gonna if you're gonna put out that kind of thing, at, le at least at least give people something to work with, you know, so they can actually get hyped. Because just the because just the name alone isn't un isn't enough to get people hyped these days. Not unless especially are... with all the, especially with all of the good faith that Disney pissed away after they acquired the uh, the IP. Well, look look at how much of an uphill battle Jedi Fallen Order had to get before people acknowledged that it was good. Oh, it's a it's a great game. Oh, it, I it, love Jedi Fallen Order. It is, but it's still a game that had everything working against it. Oh yeah, I didn't buy it until it was on a really good sale. <laughs> It was like it was still sixty bucks in store. I think it's still sixty bucks in store. I waited until a sale at one of the various bundle sites I go to where it was seven dollars. Mm -hmm. And even and because you had you had the fact that people are, that people are that it's still a it's still a sore spot regarding what happened with thirteen thirteen. That, which yeah. I think is I think it's telling that he, that all the people involved with it, if the opportunity came, they'd drop everything to work on that again in a heartbeat. Yeah, I'd really like to play thirteen thirteen, but that's never gonna happen because Disney is stupid and hates money. Um, the the uh, everything that happened with ba everything that happened with Battlefront one and two, everything that happened with the se with the sequel movies, and that little and that little remark about about um. Certain projects getting shit canned because because somebody thought that the only thing Star Wars brings is Jedi, or someone being hyper focused, or an executive being hyper focused on the whole Jedi thing, and that w and that was the reason why one of um Amy Hennig's Star Wars projects got ran out. This is what we call comically missing the point. Mm -hmm. It's a missing the point so far that were you even aiming. This is this is worse than the broadside of the barn. This is the broadside of the mountain range, yeah. and you still missed. This is this is more missing than a game of XCOM. This is more missing at point blank range than a game of XCOM. Ninety seven percent. I'm gonna blast this alien's face right off with my my, my M4. Miss, 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 miss. What the fuck, game? Yeah, I know we bring up the XCOM thing a lot, but that's because it's bullshit, and I'm going to keep bringing it up until it becomes less bullshit. Oh, that's never going to happen, Monk. Well, then I'm going to keep bringing it up until I'm dead. Touche. But the when I look at when I look at the writers that when I look at the writers that I that I have a degree of respect for. I'd say a I'd say a common theme that I see is that they don't they don't they view themselves as just a person who has a st who has a story to tell. They're self-aware enough to know to know that they are not um, God's gift. Mm -hmm. They are they're certainly not God's gift to to writing. They are not they are not trying to elevate or tr or trying to or trying to advance the genre. They're just telling a story. Um. Oh. I mean, if we just look at the Japanese auteurs that we all know and love alone, uh, Nagoshi, creator of the Yakuza series, he just wanted to create a fucking cool game about some fucking cool Yakuza tropes. Mm -hmm. And thus we got one of the best open world action RPGs ever. Mm -hmm. And make no mistake, it is an action RPG. Suck shit if you think, if you think otherwise, people. Um... <laughs> 
I think, uh, to be honest, I think trying to put Yaku Yakuza or its or its spinoffs like ju like Judge Eyes slash Judgment into into one genre is um ca is kind of forced for the trees. Uh, yes, but primary combat is an action RPG. Mm -hmm. You do level uppy stuff. You get new skills, and you also do a bunch of action during fighting. And, Thus, and by find definition, new and interesting ways to give people dr traumatic brain injuries. <laughs> TBIs? Oh, monk! Remember, Kiryu has never killed anyone. Go watch any of those compilations, people. You will question the sanity of whoever asks and wh whoever says Kiryu has never killed anyone. But it's the truth. Um, but then you look at the next auteur, the one that we've kind of already ragged on already, uh, Kojima. Mm -hmm. All of the, all of the, like, there's tons of things that people are like, that's co just Kojima thinking his shit doesn't stink. It's like, no, that's self-referential, self-deprecating humor. The man does it because, haha, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, I'm in the jokes. And he is. The man makes no, like, he, he wants to make movies, yes. And that's no that's no secret. He said that in multiple interviews. Uh, and I'd say I'd say that's more I'd say that's more of a reflection of him being a massive movie nerd than anything else. Yeah, he's a huge movie nerd. Remember, he uh, remember when he went to go watch uh, Captain Marvel and what he said on his Twitter wasn't much. He didn't say much about it, <laughs> which is telling. <laughs> but. Then, then we have the auteur of auteurs when it comes to Japan, Yoko Taro. Yeah, I knew, I knew that. I knew we were going. I knew we were going there with this. Um, who... So many people think of him as genius or possibly tormented by social anxiety, or the, the, there is a mythos around Yoko Taro that I I don't know how people got there i don't know what drugs they were on to get there i kind of want some um i think it I but think it was a case of people of of the whole a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for you know just people constantly wanting one up one upping each other on the mythos through through grape through grapevine stuff yeah but if you want to see the type of person that yoko taro actually is you look at his his uh, presentation, and I think it was at uh, TGC 2014, where Yoko Taro's whole thing is people make games in this format. I kind of make them inside out and backwards, where I have thing I want player to feel or experience and build the game around it. Doesn't matter if it makes fucking sense to do that. And holy shit, play Dragon Guard or any of the near games, and you will understand that sometimes it doesn't make any fucking sense to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but all he has is a message he and story he wants to tell people, and he just takes that, makes it the core, covers it in game. Yeah, and so, and managing to do that without ha without having message be a giant bat signal in front of me. Jesus Christ, sometimes the message is so subtle people have to go to the wiki to find that shit out. <laughs> of course, I, I think those people probably have sub-triple-digit IQs. <clears throat> I'm not sure if they can count that high. Because they're, they're, probably, they're probably the kind of people who, th who need it explained to them through, um, bin through binge-watching game theory or something. Ew... Yeah, I'm going, least, for, I'm going for the low blows tonight, folks. At least, at least you can get Yoko Taro lore from better channels elsewhere. I mean, there are lore channels for Nier and Drakengard that are as good as Bati Vidya is for FromSoft games. Oh, I, I have no, I have no doubt when it comes to that. Too highfalutin for those people, though. <laughs> um, but, and then, of course. One other thing Yoko Taro does well, and I have to I have to point this out because it's it's something that we have discussed in the past, and it's actually a I think one of his most unique among all of his peers, one of the most unique things he actually can do really well is extracurricular lore. We hate 
uh, lore outside of the media, the main media, that is required to be to understand the main media. Mm-hmm. We hate tie-in comics and tie-in shows that give us things we need to understand the main story in our game. Mm-hmm. Yoko Taro does not do this. Yoko Taro gets his main message through the game. You can play the whole game, never hit any of the supplementary materials, and understand it. Assuming you are not as dumb as a box of rocks. I make no assumptions beyond that. Or or somebody who watches CNN, or a games journalist, or a Tumblr user. <laughs> or Monk, that's person. mean. You're giving a bad name to boxes of rocks. Okay, f- okay fine, you're right. <laughs> I, apo- I apologize. I apologize to the rocks. I didn't mean to lower you down to their to the level of a games journalist. <laughs> but the supplemental materials give additional flavor, additional uh, expansion upon the lore established, rather than the rather than being merging tracks on on a train track into the single track and you have to have those all merge for the single track to exist. This is instead the game is a root and a, and a trunk of a tree and all the supplemental materials are the branches. Mm -hmm. And trust me, remember that there is a, a uh, stage play that has an epilogue to ending E of near automata that was only ever said in one stage play. Mm-hmm. God damn it. It's fantastic. You can actually find footage of it. It's not that hard. But god damn it. Yeah. But all, all of these people, they have the story they want to tell, and they're not afraid to tell it. I know, I know that there are plenty of folks who want who who want to el- who want to somehow elevate um, video game storytelling or so, or something like that. The from in my in my not so humble opinion, trying trying to do trying to do that ends up revealing more about the person arguing that than anything else. Because what it tells me is that you're self conscious about the about the games that you play. And the fact that you're not willing to just inj- just have fun with games, you need to, you need to use you need to use them as a dick measuring contest. Well, and then there's, um, I think it, it's even even more fundamental than that. Those who want to elevate storytelling within gaming, in my opinion, are comically missing the point. Again. Mm -hmm. Because storytelling within gaming is, done when done right, and this is the case with all storytelling, when done right, because when storytelling is done wrong, well, we see that things can either be so bad they're good or just so bad they're shit. When done right, storytelling in, in other mediums immerses you, makes you feel like you can see the pictures, or makes you feel some of the emotions that are being conveyed. But storytelling within video games, when done right, makes you feel a part of the narrative nearly completely. Whether you're playing a blank slate character like your Warrior of Light on Final Fantasy XIV, or that you're playing a very well-defined character, such as 2B, 9S, A2 within Nier Automata, or Snake within the Metal Gear Solid series. Mm -hmm. You are no longer an outsider. You're not someone on the outside looking in when it's done right. You're there. You are in it. You're actions on the controller matter they directly give to the narrative and that when executed correctly is some of the most intrinsic and intuitive storytelling so 
when Sam Lake says he wants to elevate storytelling in whatever fashion, it's just he wants to tell a better story. He already knows what the medium can do, and he's done much with it that has been fantastic. When David Cage says he wants to elevate storytelling, from his actions we can see that this means you others are doing it wrong. I'll show you the right way to tell stories. One is a person who wants to tell a story. The other is the person who wants to prescribe how to tell stories. And incid incidentally, I don't think I don't think I've ever heard um, Sam L Sam Lake say that he say that he wants to elevate storytelling in some manner. Yeah, it's just that that's been attributed to his efforts. Um, I personally think Sam Lake just wants to make good games and tell some really good stories. I mean, again, Max Payne one, like I said, guys. There is an entire level that sticks in my head that I can't get out of my head because it kind of horrified me as a kid. <laughs> but crying babies, trails of blood, a weird fucking funhouse dream. I mean, it, it's it's it, it's disturbing and almost gave me the same sense of dread at some points that uh, that Silent Hill did. <laughs> But it sticks because it's it was well executed. Oh, it was so good. Mm -hmm. And with now with that with that kind of thing in mind, I do get I do get the, obviously there's get obviously there's people who are who want Eclipse canceled. That's that's going to be a nothing burger, but. I think I think that's when Eclipse comes out in two or so years. It's it's not it's going to be a bit of a dud, especially since and I said this at the time. Quantic Dream is the last person I would want handling anything Star Wars related because the subject matter and their brand of storytelling don't match. Well, they're the second to the last person for me. The, the last person is EA. <laughs> well, obvi obviously, but we but we already know how that's we already know how that's going down, and we are and thank God that they don't have their exclusivity deal anymore. Mm -hmm. But as far but I do th I do think that if if the if Sam Lake and David Cage retired tomorrow, I do think history is going to look kinder on Lake. Yeah. I mean the the worst en the worst entry that's under his belt is quant is um quantum break. Exactly. I'll take that I'll take that over ha over having three strikes in a row. But I'd say that I'd say that's as good of a coda as en as any to le to lead off on this on this particular episode of Geek Watch. I do have a I do have a couple interviews that I'm that I'm going to be doing as well as a as well as a follow up to something we did on on um Friday. So on Tuesday, um I'll hopefully be having Ben Nielsen on um and dealing with the pain of of me being in central time and him being in Japan time. And we'll hope and later on we'll hopefully be be um Finishing up with the second half of feats regarding heavens and heresies, and ho so hopefully we can hand we can focus our time on the encountuary on the seventh. On Wednesday, I have an interview with a with a SF tabletop team known as the Vault. Um, Thursday, um, Black Frag Printing Press, who's working on a game called Blood and Thunder, no relation to Mastodon. And mm. Saturday, I have um, Mario Benito on, and of course, this and of course, this Sunday will be the return of Ge will be the return of Geek Watch. So keep so keep an eye out for so keep an eye out for that, or I should say next su next Sunday. Sorry, t space is warped and time is bendable. 
And as far as as far as what the subject matter is going to be for that week. Oh, this will be that'll be interesting. And we'll leave, and we'll probably be done with it in three minutes. Or not. We're never done with anything in three minutes, monk. Why do you lie like this? Yeah, that's that's like that's like saying Aiden Paladin can do, can do a ten minute video. <laughs> uh, well, color me surprised that you that you would make such jokes. Hey, she makes the jokes about herself. Mm hmm. So it's truly an indicator of who you are. <laughs> and who is that? <sighs> A man who goes beyond all things, O oh giant of light. <laughs> okay. But with but with that said, as always, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule. I'm ho I'm hoping to have a lot of crazy stuff happening here in the temple in 2022, and as and as, and a few more a few more surprises, mm. especially since, as I mentioned on the on the um new year's eve new year's eve stream on rvt i am taking steps to upgrading my computer so that i can hopefully do more do more than just recorded episodes yeah going back to live geek watches would be a little more fun mm -hmm. just remember everybody it's 2022 this party's just getting crazy <laughs> but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. <laughs>